Welcome, welcome to the live stream. I appreciate you coming on. I've been looking forward to this for quite a long time. This isn't our first rodeo, is it? No, it's not, Bruce. Um, it's great to see you again, and uh, this forum seems to work out well for us. So, yeah, I like having conversations with you. You're a good conversationalist. Um, just to, for those who who don't know, um, I'm joined today by Skip Heiss, who is the CEO of GeoNexus, and uh, they're a Critigen business partner. Um, and so uh, we, we do have a good uh, working relationship with these folks. And Skip is a long-term friend of our company. So it's a, it'll be a good conversation to have to talk about the complementary services that your platform provides to um, the services we provide in the geospatial integration space. space. Where, are you, where are you at right now, uh, Skip? I, I, it's yeah. like suburban uh, Detroit. Yeah, we're based in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm um, actually in the office. Um, I live three miles from the office, so it's easy for me to come in. Um, there's a couple of us here, um, usually two or three of us in the office at any given one, any given time. We spread out lots of room. We stay safe, social distance, and that sort of thing. What, um, what's your head? What's your head count normally? What I, I not even I yeah, don't. Know. We usually have you know. Pre-COVID and folks coming to the office, we, we can have close to 20 people in the office um, at any given time. Uh, with COVID, of course, you know, everyone is uh, working remotely and we're fortunate that we're in the uh, the technology industry where it, it's okay to do that. We can VPN, remote desktop, we can really be productive at, at home doing our job. So it really hasn't uh, impacted our business uh, too yes. much. And uh, the, the hardest part is, is that, you know, my friends aren't here, so I miss them and uh, yeah. it's quiet and uh, it, it'd be nice to, to get back together again. But uh, we'll do that in, in good time. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? I mean, the, the whole uh, my friends aren't here idea. <laughs> I, mean, I hear you. I feel, I feel you right there. That's a good, yeah. that's, it's, you know, it's, that's, actually, it's, it's actually a wake up call. I think sometimes we don't realize Maybe yeah. there's maybe there's a silver lining that comes out of COVID, and maybe that's part of it. Is that we cherish yeah. our business relationships a little bit more. Business, you know, at GeoNexus, uh, we really value company culture a lot, right? And and our core values are, are things like um, you know communication, and and one of our values is camaraderie. Right? We really cherish that, and uh, we try to to do events together and stay together and have fun together. Um, you know, so after business meetings, we'll we'll go out and, and tend to do some activities that are that are fun, and we really haven't been able to do that this year, um, which is which is kind of a bummer. But uh, we have at GeoNexus what we call uh, culture ambassadors, and uh, they've uh, taken it on uh, themselves to plan monthly uh, fun events. Um, where what we'll do is we'll come on to like a Zoom meeting or something, and we'll. We'll play games online and have kind of like a happy hour, virtual happy hour, I guess they call it. Okay. So just trying to trying to make the best of it. We did it. We did a virtual escape room not too long ago. I guess, I guess over the holidays, and then, <laughs> I haven't never done one of those like in person, so I was just a little lost the whole time. I hope we have a second shot at it because I think now I kind of get the concept. So <laughs> it took me a little while to figure the whole thing out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, let's let's review quickly. Let's just review a little bit about um, GeoNexus and about Skip Eyes, and and uh, and that'll take us into a little bit more of a technical conversation. Sure. Um, before we get started, um, I, are you on Clubhouse by chance? I don't know what Clubhouse is. What do you? Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna introduce you. Do you have an iPhone? I do have an iPhone. Okay, well, you and I are going to connect after this, and I'll get you on Clubhouse. But um, at any rate, we have a good. We had a good Clubhouse room last night. Me and a couple uh, friends from the uh, geospatial community, and our room is called "This Is the Spot uh, Geospatial Connections." We had a great, great room last night. So we do that room on Clubhouse every Wednesday at uh, seven p.m. Eastern Time, four p.m. Uh, Pacific. If you are in Clubhouse and you'd like to make more geospatial connections. The, that's the spot to be on Wednesday night. So uh, put that on your calendar, and you and I will have to talk about that. Absolutely. If you're on, if you're on watching, and we have several people that are on watching, please put in the chat where you're watching from, so that we know who you are, and that that'll give us a chance. I love, love, love if you would ask a question or two. I'm not a really good um, moderator. I, it's hard for me to conduct a conversation and watch the comments. 
but I'm going to do my very best today to be a little less um, focused on the screen and just a little bit more fo well focused on the picture and a little more focused on the on the uh, the comments. So that if you do ask a question this time, I will really try my best to make sure we address those questions. So. Um, Put in the chat where you're calling from. And if you have a question, please do not be shy because that's why one of the reasons we're here is to answer questions. And if we can't answer it, then we'll we'll find a way to, to respond at a later time, okay? So just a little bit about uh, GeoNexus. I think uh, you've been around since 2009, right? And yep. before that, Skip, you were in the GIS world, including Esri. Yeah, uh, it's been a it's been a long time, but uh, yeah, I, I uh, my background I came out of school with a, a degree in landscape architecture of all things, and uh, really was all about computers growing up and loved software and and wanted to apply software and technology to a discipline, and I found landscape architecture made a lot of sense with GIS uh, being used for land use planning and, and uh, site selection and things like that. Um, and this was back before when they were using mylar overlays to try to figure out where to site a building and so forth. So we, we got a chance to use technology to replace the, the overlays and, and do it on the computer. And that was fun. And I knew right then I wanted to go into to GIS and, um, you know, got a job out of college doing uh, spatial analysis for the Forest Service um, in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, processing satellite imagery and building GIS applications and so forth and eventually made my way over to Esri uh, where I spent about seven years um, in the Northeast working for the regional office there and that's really where you know my passion led me towards integration of Esri you know, GIS with enterprise systems for utilities. I uh, worked a lot with utilities uh, while I was at Esri and found out that you know really the power of spatial the power of GIS um, happens when you can integrate it into the business and the workflows of the utility and orchestrate it with other enterprise systems like work and asset management and customer information and outage and hydraulic modeling and so forth and I knew that's what I wanted to do um, that took me into system integration consulting where I spent about 10 years as a as a SI uh, helping organizations build custom integrations between enterprise systems, um, and through that, thought, well, there's a better way to do this. Let's let's you know build a product that makes it super easy, that's super reliable, um, and allows people to integrate their their systems um, very fast. And and started GeoNexus with that vision in mind, and you know I think we're 11 years later now, and uh, we have upwards of 50 plus. Uh, customers using our technology, licensed customers using our technology globally yeah. uh, to, to do just that, integrate their systems. You tell me, if, if this is none of my business, you say, Bruce, that's none of your business. But, <laughs> so I'm curious, um, one, did you bootstrap this thing? Uh, was that the way you did it? Or And two, did you do any of the coding yourself on the on the initial products? Yeah, that's a good question, Bruce. And um, yeah, I, I, I remember it to this day is October 13th, uh, 2009. I was in a in a position to um, uh, start a company and, and become an LLC. Um, and I had a partner that I was going to have a contract with in December of that year and uh, had, a, had a contract to, to build an integration between Esri GIS and Oracle Work and Asset Management. Um, 1.7 or 1.8 at the time uh, for a city and um, built it myself, built the first version myself. Um, I bought a book from the bookstore called, uh, you know, Flex, which is, uh, you know, the old programming language um, to build a, build a graphical user interface and called some colleagues and asked them to send me code snippets because I was stuck at certain points. And uh, <laughs> lo and behold, I came out with a with a tool that uh, that worked. And I, uh, I, I just got to tell you, <laughs> I love that. I, I'm glad I asked the converse or the asked you about the story because I just I just love that idea. I love the idea of saying, hey, I, I, I have something I know will work. And then I'm gonna to go to the bookstore. You probably went to Barn. You went. To, did you say you went to Barnes and Noble? I think it was like Barnes and Noble or, or Borders here in Ann Arbor. And uh, I sat down in one of those those uh, <laughs> chairs, in the, you know, back of the stacks, and probably read most of it right there. And yeah. Yeah, it was, or not, you had enough money to buy the book. <laughs> yeah. So self self taught. Uh, I had some friends that sent me some code and email and this and that. And 
built my first demo, got my first contract. And then from there, I was able to, um, you know, hire a developer, hire a programmer um, to come on and, and help me with that and then hire another one. Right. And so it just kind of grew from there organically over time. Um, you know, and today we're, you know, close to 25 staff with full sales and marketing, uh, software development, quality control, quality assurance departments and deliveries and customer success groups. So very cool. Very cool. Yeah. That's really nice. Hey, uh, today we, we have joining us Jeremy Connor from Birmingham, Alabama, and Keith Russell from San Diego. And it's really funny. I know both of these guys. And Jeremy's on the front end of his career, and Keith's on the on the on the end of his career, you know, doing consulting work after retiring from a GIS Excellent. position. So thanks. Glad to have you both here. And if you have any questions, please ask, ask them. And uh, again, if you're watching, please put in the chat where you're watching from, because I think there are like 10 people out there that haven't said where you're watching from. So please do that. That will help us immensely. But let's kind of continue the story then. So you, you, you started writing code and you, you produced a product that worked. Talk to me just a little bit about like, what is your experience with the, the evolution of GIS integration? Like, you know, you know, kind of in brief, let's not go too deep into it, but yeah. what has the evolution been from where you were then in 2009 to where we are today? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting. It's definitely changed over the years and evolved, I guess, over the years um, as technology evolves. It, you know, every six months, technology is evolving significantly. So it's a very fast organization, a fast uh, industry to be in. Um, it, it almost feels like GeoNexus with the vision that we had when we started was ahead of itself. And, and the industry is catching up to, to what we started back then with this idea of a you know, a productized integration. Um, there was nothing like that out there at that time. It was all custom uh, service oriented approaches. Um, and so when we were able to productize and license it, which meant we can support it and uh, support our customers with it, um, the industry started, you know, kind of, kind of catching up. You'll see a lot of today, there's a lot of the platforms available uh, for integration. Um, and well, you, you know, at Critigen, we build custom integrate. We, yeah. we build custom yeah. sync works, right? We do that. Sure. Um, and one of the concepts I think that you introduced me to is the idea of the robust, robust synchronization or the robust integration. Talk to me. Maybe you can kind of weave that into the conversation a little bit. And just and thanks, yeah. Pat and Tyler and Mark, for coming today. Ask any questions you have. Okay, go ahead. I, I interrupted you. No, no, I, you know, I think, you know, back back in the day, we, and, and, and you know this, you build custom integrations using APIs and, and coding and maybe interface tables. Um, you're lucky if the systems you're talking to have an API that you can code against uh, to put things in and take things out. Um, but it's still, it's a, it's a factory, right? You're still, you're getting your design, you're getting your requirements, you're looking at the data model and you're, you're building a custom solution, which is great and it may work fine, um, until you have to upgrade one of your edge systems and lo and behold, you have to maybe redo it or parts of it. Or if you move to another system, you may have to rebuild it. Um, so, so with the evolution of technology and the way things are going, um, we're going more from a centralized factory approach to a self-service integration approach. And, and what that means is that the, the business can now start to self-serve and pull their systems together in ways and develop the business logic in ways that they needed to do with little or no code um, through these platforms that are available. So we're, we're seeing new personas on the integration stack, like the citizen integrator, um, which is maybe a person from the business that wants to take some data from GIS and, and put it into SAP, for example, and synchronize it. And they can do that themselves very easily with no code and no real heavy lifting from the IT department um, and, and things are just kind of moving that direction. So how, how much training would that take like for that citizen integrator? Like if you have someone in the business that wants to create sort of an expertise around that, how much training would it take for him to get to the place, him or her, that yeah. they could start doing that configuration and, and uh, that custom integration? 
Yeah, so with, with our platform, it's it's very simple because it's all graphical user interface. Um, you open up the GUI, you can have drop down menus and click on the data source that you want to use. Um, and then you simply map it to the target data source and map the attributes. Um, and you can do translations um, within the GUI and set those rules up. Um, so it's really that easy in terms of point and click. So where in the past it may have taken months to build an integration um, through the centralized approach, you know, today you can install the software and in days, um, you know, start to do your integration and be up and running within weeks. Um, so, so, so in days, in days, you can start to do some integration. What if you were doing a full enterprise integration and you're relying on that? What does that project look like normally? Yeah. So, so really, the, the 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 bigger picture, like I can install my software on your computer in 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 three minutes, right? And we can connect to a Maximo, for example, or connect to Esri through a web service, and we can start integrating and, and sharing data back and forth in, with them within that same day, right? But the bigger picture is, okay, you know, what, what's the bigger picture here for integration? What does our data model need to look like on GIS? You know, are we in the geometric network? Are we moving to the utility network? What does that need to look like? What's our data governance? How do we get data in from the field? How do we manage that from a process perspective? And then on the, on the EAM side, you know, what characteristics do we need to have in EAM? What are the attributes and specifications to support their reporting, their modeling? Um, work order generation, what needs to show up on that. So it's a lot of process, data governance, what the data needs to look like, you know, and that stuff that Critigen is, is fantastic at, right? Helping helping workshop that stuff out. Where we come in is we'll, we'll, we'll glue it together simply, right? But right. once it's all figured out, um, and, then, and then once it's figured out and the rules are configured in our platform, it just runs silently in the background and keeps the orchestration of the data between the systems. That's what I was going to say. You know, that for you guys, that it it almost is so simple because, like, if if Richard Murphy goes in and, and does some uh, a data governance project, gets everybody on the same page, right? Then you can do the you can do the configuration. It just plays on its own. Yeah. Um, so it kind of makes things simple that way. Yeah, we're in the past. You still had that upfront stuff, but then you may take three or four months to go and code up the, the integration, right? right. Um, and so we, we're kind of removing that. And so we're shortening the time to value significantly. Um, yeah, and you're using the cost. And your GUI, I, I imagine that you're making, your, you're creating your GUI so it's very familiar um, to the user so that there's nothing new there. You know, it's just it's just the same old thing, huh? Yeah, and, and what that helps you do is you may start off with integrating certain data sets that are ready um, and then add more data sets over time. Um, or you may say, hey, let's add a new attribute to our GIS because we're going to go out and use Survey123 or Collector to start collecting this new attribute from our assets. And we want to carry that in our, our SAP system, for example. Um, right. So they can simply open the GUI, go to that data set, add the new attribute, and you're off and running um, yeah. in that data. Excellent. What's the typical size? If you were to look at your customer base, what's the typical size of utility where where this just fits right into their program? I mean, is that easy to do or to say, or is that kind of hard? I think it's it's probably easier to say what systems we currently support out of the box. Yeah, let's our, do that. I was going to go down that road, but you go ahead. Tell yeah, tell yeah. So. so you know, we support out of we have connectors that are supported out of the box for Maximo, uh, SAP, Esri, of course, um, ABB Ellipse and ABB Asset Suite, um, and Oracle Work and Asset Management and Oracle Utilities Customer Care and Billing. And that list is growing constantly. We're, we have roadmap. Um, we're going to be coming out with an N4 EAM connector shortly. Um, we're looking at some of the CIS systems that are available and OMS systems that are out there. So it takes us, uh, you know, a little bit to, to build a connector, but once it's built, it's in our library and available for use. So um, once so, your once your in four connector is done, I mean, you've got almost everything available commercially in the EAM space, right there. Yeah, and then you know, then our we're kind of looking at the um, you know. So if you think about those systems, a lot of times they're large organizations that have those systems, so they're pretty big utilities. But there is a whole tier of I would say smaller co-op type utilities that that may have a you know a different system, a tier two system perhaps. Um, and there's a lot of them out there, a lot of them. And uh, so 
you know, we're, we're, we're open to, to building some connectors and in, in, in some of those other uh, EAM systems and CIS systems to, to support, you know, the mid and smaller utilities. So you say so you do, so you would, given the right circumstances, you would build a connector for that mid tier, small utility. Yeah. yeah I okay. think that's where we're kind of heading with things. You know, we'll, we'll, um, you know, we'll support our, our philosophy is, you know, that's, if there's a market for it and we can add it to our library, let's, let's go for it. And, and it just broadens the, the scope of the capabilities we can work with. And, and when you think about that, Bruce, you think about, oh, well, I have meter data, like a revenue meter in my CIS system, CCMB, for example. I also have a record for that meter in my Maximo system because it's an asset that I have to manage. And I want to know where that meter is in uh, geography. So it's in my GIS system. Well, now, you know, our platform, you could synchronize all three of those systems okay. or four systems or five systems. So you can start to orchestrate data across your entire um, ecosystem using the, using the platform. So you have multiple plugins there to, to right. bring in multiple systems, not just like not just like Esri to EAM, but you can right. bring other, other things into the picture. That's right. That's, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I we all no we we can go down we can go so far down that rabbit hole. I don't want to continue down that, but yeah. that's all good information. I, tell me, are you do you have a solution for the cloud? Like so, so many of the utilities we're working for are going to you know the cloud. In, all across the business, do, is your so does your platform perform well in the cloud, or what? Tell me what that looks like in the cloud for you guys. Yeah, so right now, you know, I, I think utilities tend to be a little conservative when it's going to the cloud because of sensitive data and so forth, rightly so. Um, but we are seeing the trend of, of having folks move to the cloud. We do actually have a few customers live in the cloud. Um, so uh, Maximo, for example. Uh, there's a few organizations, including IBM, that host Maximo um, for their uh, utility or for their customers, right? So, um, but then they, some of these customers have GIS on premise. Um, so we have a couple right now that are live with synchronizing data between an on-premise geo database on a server on premise and Maximo, for example, in the cloud, um, and that's working just fine. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Does your does your does your platform live in the cloud then, or on prem? No, in that case, it it, it can live on. It lives on prem. In that case, um, it can be what we call hosted uh, in the cloud. So I can put it on my server and, and go through the cloud to connect other systems. One thing when you talk about cloud, you need to be careful because there's applications that are hosted in the cloud, which just means that server is somewhere else, right? Right. Right. Um, and then there's cloud native, which means it's a true multi-tenant you know, SaaS application. Um, our technology today is not multi-tenant SaaS, right? So it needs to sit somewhere dedicated for that tenant. Um, and then so that can your, be your platform will sit on-prem or be hosted in the cloud, right? There you go, yep. Okay, yep. So that's a good distinction. That's a that's a good direction to make. So, so uh, would you say that this is the thing of the future um, or are you still thinking that it might be a while before that's completely adopted? Well, I think it's moving. Um, again, it seems like it's a little slower in utilities, but it is moving there. We are we are seeing it uh, more and more. Um, I, I think it's inevitable. Esri just came out with or announced um, uh, their their cloud version for utilities, for small utilities. I think it's, um, I'm not sure exactly what the, the term is called, but um, where a smaller utility that doesn't want to have the infrastructure on site can actually, you know, access the utility network through the cloud. Which nice. is pretty cool. So yeah. I, I see it's just heading that way and, and we're going to be there with it. You know, we, we, we have a roadmap and we're always looking ahead at what's next. And, um, you know, we're currently going through some prototyping and some, some visioning on a, um, cloud native application for for GeoNexus, um, okay. so that you can you can you know provision it through the SaaS application in the cloud and, and connect your systems together. Nice. Right, so well, you're thinking the future then. Then uh, just uh, I want to welcome Tyler um, Suda from uh, Tyler. No welcome Tyler. There. And we also have Pat from uh, Esri that's joining. Nice yep. So thanks, Pat and Mark Tates. Um, thanks for coming on, and Diana, we appreciate you you're, um, watching today. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about like one of the claims that you make uh, with that your platform um, assists in um, 
uh, increasing data quality, right? That, to, and I, I know what that looks like, but I'm just, just yeah. to explain to some of the folks that might be watching. So, so tell me how a robust synchronization like you guys have your platform, how does that change the data quality? Like, well, what is the, what is the, the yeah. work? Yeah, things. so data, you know, data quality is is a, a core focus. So GeoNexus, we we care about data quality. You know, the reason that we're doing what we do with the technology that we have is to make sure that the data is reliable and accurate for making business decisions. And when you have data that's spread across different utility enterprise systems, you have to have a real good way, uh, robustly, to keep those databases in sync or keep that data in sync so that it's accurate. Uh, we had a, a customer, uh, utility customer, electric, a large customer in the southwest that um, uses Maximo and Esri, and there was discrepancies between the two. Uh, you'd go into Maximo and you'd look up some transformers in a pole, and it would say something different than the Esri system. And so field users and, and, and so forth would get real frustrated um, because the lack of trust, right? You know, I don't know what is right, so I start writing down in my map book in my truck. And that's really my source of truth. Yeah. So there's a real problem there. You're not taking advantage of your technology because of the lack of consistency and accuracy of your data between them. Um, and so we came in and said, well, let's, let's hook up our platform and we'll connect these systems together. And the first thing we want to do is this, let's run it, let's run it. And let's, and it's going to report out all of our discrepancies. Um, so we had a, you know, within a matter of, you know, the time to configure it, we were able to generate a report that showed us our duplicates, that showed us our orphan records between the systems and showed us attribute discrepancies. GIS says it's a you know, six and Maximo says it's a two, you know, for example, for an attribute. Um, and then what happened is, is that report drives initiatives for data cleanup. They could take that report and go to their you know, upper management and say, hey, look, you know, we need to clean this data up. We need an initiative, a project around this. And uh, and then you can run the GeoNexus platform over time through that initiative and see how that data becomes more and more closer together in terms of its synchronization. So you, then, you could literally take your your report that talk your discrepancy report, and you can right. create a whole data healing workflow around that report. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's nice, and that's a nice feature to have. Um, if if you know if you're interested in having your data be 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 right across the board. I, you know, one of the things we experience in our work with utilities is that the people who are in charge of the assets right now are of a certain age, maybe my closer to my age, maybe a little older. They're the people who actually built the systems and they, they're not as reliant on the data that's in, in the system as some of the younger folks who didn't build it. They don't really they don't really know where it's at. I mean, they're good people. They just didn't build it. Right. And so um, as we continue to see that aging workforce, you know, that the correctness of the data will make so much more of a difference for them, I think, uh, as you go forward. Yeah, and even on that note, we have a customer that, uh, you know, the, the the gentleman in charge of the integration, it's a smaller utility and, and the, the guy built it himself and, you know, it was his baby and, and uh, you know, he's at retirement age and you know, he'd been there for you know, 20, 30 years or whatever. And and uh, he's like, hey, listen, I, I'm gonna retire, but I don't wanna leave my organization with this piece that I built, this custom thing, because I'm the only one that knows how to run it. Right. So they asked us to come in and replace it with this productized approach and train their folks on it so that he can retire and, and be, you know, rest assured that he's leaving his organization in a good spot. So he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to have heartburn, wake up in the middle of the night and think, what did I leave? Yeah, that's good. Hey, I, I wanted, this is, this conversation is kind of wrapping up. And so before I, before we actually wrap up, I just wanted to say, if you have any questions about, uh, about GIS integration and even more specifically about synchronization best practices. And you've got, you know, our expert here uh, online. So please ask any questions you have um, and we'll get them answered. But the last question I wanted to ask you, Skip, is, you know, you, you said early on in the conversation that, that things change every six months. And I'm sure that you as a strategic leader, you're looking out in the future and you're saying, what do I need to look forward to? What What do I got to solve for in 2022 and 2023? So maybe you could tell me, you know, what do you think? What do you think is out there in your future? I mean, do you have any ideas? Do you have any strategic vision? Yeah, so there's a, there's a few things, you know, you know, as a as a founder and CEO of this company, I'm I'm 
you know, thinking about all different things from the tactical things. What do we need to take care of next week and, and, and making sure that my managers are, are getting what they need to, to address those tactical issues. Um, and I have some great, great, great folks I'm working with and, and trying to get them the resources they need. Um, whether it's, you know, more programmers or more delivery folks uh, to support our, our project work and our customer success to make sure our existing customers are, are getting the value from our technology. Um, so we want to make sure we cover those bases um, adequate, adequately and, and successfully. But we also want to look to the future. Um, what are, you know, what are our customers telling us that, you know, they need moving forward, like, you know, they're moving to the utility network. So we need to support the utility network, which we do. But, um, you know, things like that, right? Where are they heading? What what ecosystem of systems do they have that would they would like us to support from a connector perspective? Um, this year, we're really placing a lot of emphasis on customer success. And so we're dedicating some customer success managers to all of our accounts um, and do quarterly check-ins with them to make sure that, you know, they're getting, they're successful and they're getting good value from our technology. And if they're not, you know, we want to know about that so we can uh, move forward and, and help them. Uh, having sold software in my past, Skip, it's the most frustrating thing in the world to go through this this long sales process where you demonstrate the value, and then six months later, no one has even cracked open the box yet. You know, it's right. a, it's it's right. a really bad spot to be. So, um, I completely understand that. Hey, I wanted to show this comment from Pat. And Pat, thanks for being on today. Um, and he, he's showing us a link there that uh, talks about, I'm sure this is an article that he wrote. Um, and this is the new <laughs> yeah, thanks, Pat. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Pat. So um, if you want to, if you want just to, to copy and paste that um, link to that article, if you'll look at the recording of this, you can get to the comments and you can just cut that, that link right out and, uh, and use that and, and follow it to the article. But thanks, Pat, for contributing on that. Appreciate it. Well, before we go, any last words or any last things that you think are interesting or important for our customers and for your customers to hear about? I don't think, I think we covered quite a bit of it. You know, I, I just want to say thank you to you, Bruce, for having me. And uh, this is a subject that's uh, near and dear to my heart. And uh, I love talking about it. And so hopefully, uh, you know, we'll continue to spread the word around, um, you know, integration. It's, it doesn't have to be hard and complex like it was in the past, it's, it, it can be done. It's, it's fairly straightforward these days with technology. It still takes a lot of, you know, thought in terms of process and data governance, but uh, from a technology perspective, we can get it up and running fairly quickly. So yeah, that, I don't want to go too far back into the conversation and recreate this, but one of the things I was thinking of, you know, as far as the evolution of integration, you know, it used to be, it used to be, okay, we're going to, we're going to do this in months instead of years. Right. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about we're going to do this in weeks instead of months, and right. uh, and it just shows really the advances that have been made, and um, you know what used to be just a monumental heavy lift and program is very manageable and very understandable for the whole business. So I I think having solutions like like GeoNexus solution, and then some qualified services like Critigen offers, you know you can have these these really really effective value laden integration projects that return quickly in weeks rather than months. I Absolutely. think that's, that's a great advancement. So um, appreciate having you here, Skip, and, and hopefully we'll do it again. I want to yeah. tell the listeners too that this, you know, this these recordings live on the Critigen YouTube channel. They also live on the Critigen website, so you can search for them. Um, obviously there's a lot of buzzwords here that you can search for, you know, you can search Skip's name and and uh, synchronization and integration. And hopefully you'll find those videos if you wanna look at them in the future. And please, if you're watching, please take a minute to invite somebody uh, to the live stream. We do it every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. I'm gonna continue to do it until everybody comes. So you'll just have to, you'll just have to figure out how you make it a part of your life and hopefully you'll get all your friends to come too. So, Skip, hopefully this isn't the only time we do this. We do it again, and, uh, sure. and I look forward to that possibility. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's been great talking to you. We'll talk to you soon. Everybody, ciao.